Good afternoon. I'm, I'm Conley Weinbarger. I'm Vice President and Chief Academic Officer for the College. It's my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon for the first uh, SciTech lecture presentation in 2014. Our, uh, for those of you who don't know, our SciTech lecture series began about three years ago, and the purpose is to highlight all of the great things that are happening in science and technology research and the, the contributions of individuals. It's been a great series. We've had hundreds of folks like yourself come out to hear our series, so we, so we couldn't be prouder of the work that's done with the series. I, uh, I want to just say that, you know, events like this don't just happen. It takes a lot of work and effort. And I want to recognize uh, Russ Reed and his folks for the work that they do to organize and plan the SciTech series. They, they've done a great job for us, and we really appreciate that, as uh, evident by the success of the series. I also want to recognize Ms. Andrea Keppel, one of our Board of Trustee members, who is always a big supporter of the college and is here today. Thank you, Andrea. We appreciate that. So, without further ado, I want to ask Nancy Johnson, Executive Director for the North Carolina Biotechnology Center, Piedmont Triad uh, Office, to come up and introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Nancy. Okay, my, my work's done. I can go sit down. You've already applauded. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Dr. Weinbarger. Uh, that's why it's good to have other folks introduce you because of that long title. And if you think I have a long title, wait until you hear about this gentleman I want to tell you about. Um, Russ, thank you for giving me the honor to introduce uh, Gwyn Riddick. Gwyn Riddick's considered a man of great stature, not only in this region, but across the state. And many in this room consider him a great friend, a confidant, and a great advisor. So it's so good to have you back. He has not only been a past cultivator of beautiful gardens and greenhouses as CEO of his own horticulture enterprise for 17 years, but he has also been an integral part of cultivating, nurturing, and helping to grow relationships across the state and in this region, so thank you. I first met Gwen in his role as director of this Piedmont Triad office which he really trailblazed in 2003 when it opened. And that seems to be a common thread with his career. So I think we're going to learn a little bit more about how he plows those first opportunities. I look forward to learning from you, Gwen. And um, you are just leaving your role as vice president formally of ag biotech for the state. And we are very pleased that you are going to continue to help us as far as strategic consulting with growing ag bi biotech. Uh, today, your formal title is Principal Consultant at Riddick Enterprises, focusing on bionomic ecology for companies and organizations involved in agricultural biotechnology. So you should have Gwyn's bio in your packets. However, I did want to highlight just a few of his many accomplishments and basically tell you the why of why you should listen to what he has to share today. So Gwyn received his Bachelor of Science degree in Microbiology from The Ohio State University and his MBA from Butler University. He has more than 35 years of experience. I think that's three decades plus, is that right? So in life science and horticulture industries, he has managed manufacturing operations for the life sciences and consumer products division of the Dow Chemical Company. He was a faculty member of North Carolina State University, all while serving as the Guilford County Director of Cooperative Extension Service and the Director of Economic Development and Business and Industry Education at Guilford Technical Community College. I'd be curious, of your career, which has been the longest title? 
that you've held. I'm, I'm just curious as I read this. And today, in addition to his new company, he is a fellow of the Natural Resource Leadership Institute and works as a freelance journalist covering ecology, environment, and horticulture. So, Gwen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you home, and we're so happy to have you back in the Piedmont Triad. And Judy and I will tell you that if you come back to the Piedmont Triad and you think you're retired, then you are mistaken. So please join me in welcoming Gwen to the podium. This mic's working good, right? Let me turn this one on as well. How's that sound? Can you hear? Folks, thank you so much. And uh, Dr. Uh, Weinbarger, thank you very much for allowing me to be here today. And it's always good to be back to Forsyth Tech. Uh, I know when I was here before and also when I worked at Guilford Tech, we had a tremendous number of collaborations with Forsyth Tech. And the fact that this particular college works so hard with us as well as Guilford Tech uh, to develop those biotechnology uh, programs and also being the first in nanotech is just outstanding in the state. So it's great to be here and to be associated with such a great uh, college. And uh, Nancy, outstanding uh, introduction. You gave me a lot to live up to. I didn't know that you were that good at fiction. That is really good. <laughs> That's terrific. And then my uh, great friend, Russ Reed, over here that has always been my mentor and uh, great support, not only when I was here, but even continuing after I left. Russ, thank you. Thanks for inviting me, and it's good to be here. And I couldn't uh, uh, say hello here to you folks without acknowledging my former right hand, Judy, over here in the front row. And she and I really uh, worked uh, closely together to help develop this office that was here that uh, Nan Nancy is now uh, doing great things in here in, in this region. So Judy, it's been such a pleasure to work with you and know you for so, so many years. You're a great friend. Thank you. And then my wife, Susan. She didn't have anything better to do today, so she uh, came along and, and, and uh, rode with me today. So uh, I see many good uh, friends here and folks that I haven't seen in a few years. So it's, it's good to be back. Uh, you may know I do live just down the road about uh, 30 miles in Trinity. So I'm in the edge of Randolph County, just over the Guilford County line. I uh, grew up here and then was away for about 15 years and then moved back and have been here ever since. So. I, you know, you know a little bit about me, but I don't think I know enough about you folks. So I always like to ask everybody uh, a little bit about who you are. So how many people in here are students? Do we have any students? We got several. How about faculty? Faculty folks? Oh, we got good faculty. How about researchers? Anybody doing research of any kind? No researchers? How about farmers? One farmer. All right. Now we're getting somewhere. How about anybody that ever lived on a farm? Wow, that's, that's more. How about anybody that actually engaged in farming when you were living there? Same number? Pretty close? Grandparents that had a farm? How about that? Bigger number. So that tells us a profile of the kind of folks that we are nationwide. They're much like you are with things like science and agriculture. And so what I wanted to talk to you about today is the interface of science, biotechnology, and agriculture. Because that's what I've been working on for the last four years. Now, it's interesting to me that, and I've kind of made a little bit of a mini study of this as I look around and, and talk to folks and I travel around the U.S. and out of the country. And what I find is, certainly here in the United States, there's only about 
15% of us in the United States that really are trained well in the sciences and that still practice the sciences. That's not very many folks. But there's even less folks that practice the production of agriculture. They tell us somewhere around one to one and a half percent. So that means the majority of us don't know a lot about science and we don't know a lot about agriculture because we've never done it. We've not been trained in it. Guess what? When you don't know a lot about something, it's called the unknown, right? Guess what people think about the unknown? It's scary. It creates fear. So when you have fear created, guess what that does? It means that you start getting a lot of information that's misinformation that you've heard or you've read. Maybe it's not real accurate. And so today, in the United States, we have a lot of folks that get a lot of misinformation about science and about agriculture, and they don't understand it. So today I hope to talk to you a little bit about that in ways that you can help, because you can spread the word, because the percentage of folks in this room are much more adept at agriculture and probably certainly uh, sciences than most of the population because you're, you're associated a lot here with the, uh, with the college. So let's, uh, let's take that theory a little bit further. And you saw that uh, the name of uh, my title tonight is A Race Against Time and how biotechnology is transforming our largest critical industry. Well, I'm going to tell you why it's a race against time, but also I, get, I think probably by now you know what is, I'm going to say is the largest critical industry. In my estimation, it's critical, but by everybody else's measure, it's the largest in North Carolina, and that's agriculture. Largest industry we have. $77 billion industry at the consumer gate. So it's a big industry, but people don't know a lot about it. Now, I've also noticed that people that are, say, 50 years old and younger have a very romantic notion about agriculture. They think, oh, those were the old days when everything was easy and the value system was still around and we had close-knit families and you got to go out and raise your own food and your cattle were out grazing in the pasture and you had a few horses galloping through the uh, the the pasture as well, and everything was just so tranquil and so nice. Well, let me tell you, I grew up on a farm, and there wasn't a lot romantic about it at all. Maybe, maybe that bull with his herd over there might have been, somebody might have said romantic, but it wasn't real romantic. It was hard work. I remember from the time I was probably about eight or nine years old, you know, there were no babysitters, there were no nannies. You went to the field with your parents, regardless of your age, and you were expected to do something rather than just play in the dirt. And so I remember those days very well, and as I grew older, I also remember those 12 and 14 hour days, six days a week. That wasn't romantic. And so needless to say, as soon as I got to be 18, I decided I needed to go somewhere else and learn something else that might make more money and might be a little easier to do, at least in my estimation. So that's a short history of how romantic farming was to me. Now, I enjoyed it. It was good hard work, and it created good values. But today, uh, folks have a different look at it, and there's a lot of misunderstanding out there. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about First, the Biotechnology Center. Tell you because I think there's probably some folks in here that don't know about the Biotechnology Center. And then I also wanted to tell you about some companies and some technology that we have here in North Carolina that's extremely exciting. And it's at that interface of biotechnology and agriculture. So as we continue to look, 
at what we're doing in this industry, at these two industries, we're looking at the two biggest industries in North Carolina. Biotechnology at the consumer gate's about $65 billion. And I already told you agriculture is $77 billion. So the Biotechnology Center, we were created, this is going to be, uh, Nancy, our 30th uh, anniversary, isn't that right? And uh, so we were created by the legislature to do really two things. We were created as an economic development agency to create jobs and to create revenue in the biotechnology sector to bring more biotechnology into the other sectors in North Carolina where it was viable. And one of those sectors is agriculture. So we do that through, as this slide says, through promoting research, promoting business, and developing education programs for folks around the state. What I've been working on the last four years has been agricultural biotechnology. And the best way to explain that is it's the interface or the intersection where the two meet. Agriculture is very heavily scientific today. But the idea is that biotechnology and the, and the sciences in biotechnology can bring even more science to agriculture because we have a lot of new techniques and a lot of new things we've learned just in the last 15 years that we can apply to agriculture. So that's where we are, that's what we're doing, and that's what we're talking about tonight. Now, as I've already mentioned, uh, our largest industry is agriculture, but it's also our oldest industry. And that's pretty much true of any state or any country, certainly in the United States and probably in most, uh, most any other country, it's your oldest, it's your first industry, and it, it goes all the way back probably 10,000 years to when we quit being just hunters and gatherers. We started to learn how to grow plants. Now this picture shows something that uh, some people might say is romantic because you see horses in the picture. And uh, that's the way that it used to be on the farm. And I'm probably the only one in here that's ever plowed with a horse. But, oh, there's one, a mule. Those are harder to work with than horses. But today on the farm, they use, of course, tractors and all kinds of equipment, and it's GPS operated. It means it knows where to go. And as I used to tell Judy, that horse I plowed behind used to know when the day was done and where to go to the barn. It knew how to go, and it went, whether I wanted to go or not. So things have changed quite a bit. And it's not that romantic, it's hard work. Two of the programs that we provide at the Biotechnology Center are loans, and those are small amounts of money that we provide to young companies to get them up, get them growing, to get them uh, kind of a leg up so that they can develop products and take it to the marketplace. It's a space for funding and investment for us where nobody else wants to play because it's a very risky proposition as you get young companies. As we were talking before, uh, entrepreneurs, how do you pick the winners? It's very difficult, but it takes a lot of study. And that's what we do when we give loans. We're very careful, we're very conservative, and most of the folks we pick are winners. You can see that by the figures I've got on the slide here. Every dollar we invest in a loan for a young company over the last 30 years, brings back revenue to North Carolina of $295 because they go out and leverage that money. On the right side of the slide, you see there are grants. Well, the grants go to universities and institutions that do nonprofit research. And the nonprofit research turns ideas into innovations which then the companies can take to the marketplace. Our return there, you can see, is 64 to 1, 64 dollars that they leverage every dollar we grant them into those additional 64 dollars. Good return. I wish my savings account did that. It would be wonderful. As we do that, I've just put a sample here on this slide of a few of the uh, institutions and folks that we work with in North Carolina. There's actually hundreds. We're kind of known as a resource place that can connect people 
to other people and connect resources to resources and people to resources. That's what we do. That's what Nancy and Judy do every day here in this office. And it's something that's critical to build that community and to build that industry as we continue to build it. So you probably recognize some of those names. Now I want to tell you, and there's one thing I would like for you to know when you leave tonight, and that is there's a tremendous potential for our future using biotechnology at the interface of agriculture. You see that 30 and 10 there on the left? What that really means is that a lot of our leaders in North Carolina said there is so much potential to develop more biotech sciences into agriculture that we think we can grow agriculture another $30 billion in the next 10 years. That would be over a $100 billion industry. And so that's what we've been working towards. Now, to do that, we've really established in North Carolina what I'm calling the World Ag Biotech Hub. And it's something that nobody else has. I put a few bullets in here to let you know some of the examples of that. For example, in the last 18 months, about eight companies have invested over $300 million in capital expansion in North Carolina. 13 companies have announced over 950 new jobs created. And this, this is just in the ag biotech space. North Carolina also has six of the top seven big international multinational ag biotech companies in North Carolina. Uh, the seventh one is the one I used to work for, Nancy uh, Dow AgriSciences, and they said as long as I'm here, they don't need to come here. So, but or they don't come. I'm not sure which. But uh, I'm just joking. Dow does come here all the time, and it's amazing all of the companies from around the world that come to North Carolina every week to conduct business. And you never know they're here unless you're involved in their business. So we do have over 80 companies that are here in North Carolina that are ag biotech companies, and it represents about 8,700 jobs. So it's still young, it's still growing. The whole industry of ag biotech is very young. Agriculture's not young, biotech is not young, but them coming together is young. Because the majority of the ag biotech work that's been done has been done in the last 15 years. So that's pretty darn recent. Here's the uh, six of those big seven that you probably recognize the names of, and uh, the Syngenta's right here in the, in the Piedmont. Um, we don't know, everybody keeps buying each other and uh, moving things around, so we don't know for how long. Uh, what I've been working on, and we're calling the Ag Biotech Initiative, and that initiative, again, is to grow jobs and grow revenue in Ag Biotech. I've got four pictures here. And right in the middle, it says a race against time. What does that mean? What it means is we're working with animal crops, vegetable crops, forestry, marine crops, because there are crops that we harvest from the ocean, plants as well as animals. And we eat them or we use them for medicine or various other things. There is a race against time to make sure that these things remain viable so that everything you see there stays healthy and sustainable for the future. And I'm gonna tell you why it's a race against time. Does anybody in here like baseball? George, you probably are a baseball fanatic, but uh, do you remember, anybody remember Yogi Berra, catcher for the Yankees? Well, you know, if you ever read any of his quotes, you know he gave some pretty crazy quotes, and it, he had an odd way of saying things. So they asked him one time, uh, back in the early 60s, they said, well, Yogi, this was a news interview he was doing with a newspaper. Yogi, tell us, are you going to win the pennant this year and then go to the World Series? And you know he's a catcher, so he had this big catcher's bit, and he put his catcher's mitt on his hip and he spits some tobacco juice out and he says well he said predictions are really difficult especially if they're about the future <laughs> so so the key is they are difficult 
but people have made predictions, and the prediction they've made is that we reached 7 billion people in the world in 2012. That's what the United Nations tells us. They also tell us, along with the World Food Organization, that we're not going to have enough food to feed the people that will be here in 2050, which is going to be 9 billion people. So how are we going to grow that food? Well, you say, well, you just grow out and you plant it in the ground and you grow it. But that's not possible, and I'm telling you why. We don't have any more acreage to grow stuff on. We're already growing everything on all of the good land around the world. The only way that we could do it would be to tear up more forests or more forest land, which we know that's not necessarily a good thing, and all of those soils are not all good either. We also know that our water is going to be in huge demand. You do not create any more water. The same amount of water is here today that was here when Jesus was on earth, ten, and also 10,000 years ago when man started existence. At least that's what they tell us. You don't create water, you just recycle it. So as the population grows, water's going to be in greater demand, and it's going to be divided up. That pie is going to be divided up in smaller pieces. So that means there's not as much water for agriculture. The other thing that, that's playing a role here is that if we're going to use the same amount of land, the same amount of water to grow what they tell us for 9 billion people will be double the amount of food that we're growing now, which they also tell us equals all of the food that's been grown since man started growing food for the last 10,000 years. But we've got to grow 10,000 years worth of food in the next 35 years to feed that population. That, folks, is a race against time. And the only way that we see, and that most experts see, a race that can be won is to apply more science that we've learned into the science and the agronomy of agriculture. So that's where we are today, and that's the picture that we see every day. Now there's a solution to that, and the solution is we develop new traits in plants that will help them have bigger yields. For example, more disease resistance, drought resistance, improved use of fertilizer so that we don't have to use as much fertilizer, improved quality traits in the plants that we're producing or the food that we're producing or whatever it is we're producing. Because if we can have a better quality, then it's going to be either more nutritious or it's going to nutritious or it's going to it's going to go further. That a lot of these traits have already been started in the last 15 years, and there's more coming down the road. Now the interesting part for me that I get to see every day is that I've made you a little pie chart here, and I've divided it up into potential. The little sliver you see over there, the light green one on the right that says GMOs, GMO stands for genetically modified organism. That's happened in the last 15 years where we've improved our crops with some of those traits that I told you about earlier. That's the part that most people know about in the public, but there's a tremendous amount of misinformation about its value and how it's being done. And that's where I refer back to what I said when I began this talk earlier. So one of the things we have to do is we have to figure out how to solve that misinformation. But more traits are coming in the GMOs, but the potential is the rest of that pie. Diagnostics. Plants have the ability to produce diagnostic compounds to diagnose disease for humans, animals, and plants. Plants have the ability to produce therapeutics in the plant for humans, animals, and plants. Plants are going to give many different consumer benefits, things like nutrition, better nutrition, things like helping us manage our waste and to remediate environmental problems. So George, that'd probably be a help to you, those environmental things whenever they pop up. 
One of the phrases I would like for you to remember is, and this is something I'm a little bit of an evangelist on, is that plants rule. Plants are the answer. Plants are the future. Plants can be the factories of the future. Uh, one of the things I tell people is look around the room at all of the things you can see or anywhere you go during the day. Everything that you can see or touch can be, has been, or will be made from a plant, except for things made out of metal and things made out of glass or silica-based. Think about it. If you can find anything else, you let me know. But plants can do it, have done it, and will do it. And for all I know, they might grow metal someday in them. I don't know. But we can even get plastics from plants today. We get medicine. We get diagnostics. So let me tell you a little bit about those real quickly. The uh, farmers have really adopted these new technologies faster than any technology they've ever adopted in, in history. Uh, the reason they've done that is because it saves money, it saves time, uh, produces higher yields. Humans, us, we, public, we get more benefits because less pesticides going into the environment, less soil erosion, less greenhouse gas emissions, and there's a whole long list of benefits that I've already alluded to a little bit, but more than we can probably talk about tonight. But they're there and they're coming and they're getting better every year. One of the things we've done to do what I'm talking about, create those new traits, is we at the Biotechnology Center have created what we call a Biotechnology Crop Commercialization Center. Another word for that that I like to use is solutionism. We've created a center to commercialize new products, new traits, and crops to bring solutions, solutions to the marketplace. For example, if in North Carolina we grow a crop really, really well, if it's sweet potatoes or whatever it might be, we first go to the marketplace and we say, is there a way that we can sell more of this in the market? If we could do something with this crop to grow more of it or sell more of it, what do we need to do? Is there a technological problem that's causing us not to get that much into the market? If the answer is yes, then we say, what is the problem? Then we say, okay, what technology will it take to solve it? Once we find that, we say, well, how much is it going to cost? And then we say, well, who's going to fund it? And then once we put all that together, then we start working back towards the market with a solution. So that's what the Crop Commercialization Center does. Increases crop value and lowers costs with more benefits. Let me tell you a little bit about a couple of companies here uh, real quickly that you may have never heard about doing some outstanding science things that fit into these categories I'm talking about. The first one I want to talk to you about is Agile Sciences. And Agile is actually a company that went to the ocean. They found a sea sponge that produces a compound that destroys bacterial biofilms. Well, if there's any microbiologist in the room other than me, a biofilm is something that covers up the colonies of bacteria and protects them. It's almost impermeable. So when you try to, if it's a problem in your body or an animal, and you got a biofilm colony in there and it's causing disease and you give it an antibiotic, that biofilm resists the antibiotic. Same things with a biofilm in a plant. They resist the pesticide. So you can't get to the bacteria to kill it. So they found a compound that will destroy the biofilm so that you can get something in there to kill the bacteria and solve your problem, another solution. So it's very exciting, they got lots of uses. An example of a biofilm to relate to have any of you ever heard of tartar? Have you ever had tartar on your teeth or know somebody? That's a biofilm. And you know that if people neglect it, they can have a lot of problems with their health. Grassroots Biotechnology is another company in North Carolina that's working below ground. And that's where a lot of people have never worked, below ground, unless you're a 
cave dweller or something. But that means they're working with the roots of plants. Most of us, most consumers, they look at a plant and say, wow, that's a good looking plant. But you're basing that on what you see above ground. But if the roots are bad or having a problem, that plant's going to die. So they found that there's a lot of interactions, chemical reactions, uh, synergistic reactions between bacteria, fungi, nematodes, all kinds of organisms in the soil that are constantly working and, and living with those roots. And you got a relationship going back and forth, very dynamic, day and night, all day, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. They've learned how to read that and to use it and to harness it to grow a better plant. And as a result, about six months ago, they got bought by Monsanto so they would have the technology. Another program that we work with in the biotech center is that we try to bring all of this knowledge, all of this information to our farm community. So in the past couple of years, we've created some farm grower meetings and we've taken that information to them so they'll have that. That means in the future, farmers like when you folks grew up on a farm, may not grow the common plants and the common crops. They may be growing specialty crops. And guess what? They may be measuring their crop in milliliters instead of bushels because we're looking at high dollar specialty things like medicinal compounds, therapeutics, and diagnostic compounds that can come from plants. Another example of that, company down in Charlotte it's called soy meds. Probably most of you have eaten soybeans in one form or another. Maybe some of you have grown them. But it's a super high protein vegetable. It's in North Carolina, it's 44% of the soybean is protein. That's a lot of protein. This company has learned how to get that plant to use that protein in a way that it can grow different compounds that can be used in medicine or even a vaccine. Can you imagine a vaccine in a bottle with a bunch of soybean seeds that you take the seeds and you grind them up, you put them in some water and you drink it? You've been vaccinated. Wouldn't that be something? Or if, if you know, one of the countries that needs vaccines the most with, has a lot of disease right now that's not been eradicated is Africa. They don't have a lot of refrigeration. So maybe you take this and you can ship it and you don't have to, you can put it on the shelf, you can take it off, you can grind it up, you can give it to people and you can vaccinate people. So another company, we talked about diagnostics before. This is called Advanced Animal Diagnostics. They've learned how to work with the dairy industry. And as we all know, that's a huge industry in, in, in worldwide and certainly in the U.S., if a cow gets mastitis, any of you have ever heard of mastitis, it's an infection of the milk gland. If a farmer's got a whole barn full of cows that he's milking, all that milk goes into a big tank. Well, they test that before they ship it for bacteria. If they test it and they see bacteria because one, one cow out of 100 had mastitis, guess what? They have to dump it. They lose all that milk, all that money. These folks have developed a test that they can test every cow in the barn and take it offline if it's infected, which is going to be worldwide a billion dollar product. This is another company in North Carolina that has learned how to take enzymes that are natural enzymes, put it in animal feed, like for pigs and chickens, and when they eat it, it digests, it makes it easier for them to digest the cellulose in the feed. What does that do? Well, it decreases the amount of feed that they have to be fed, which saves money. And then it also allows that animal to use the feed more efficiently. So uh, it keeps our food costs low. Last company I want to talk to you about is Metacago. And Metacago is a company some of you may have read about because it's so spectacular, the science that they've harnessed. This is a company that grows tobacco plants, one of the big things that we used to grow in North Carolina, and we're still number one in the U.S. in tobacco. But 
tobacco they've learned also has a lot of protein. And they've learned that they can make a tobacco plant grow proteins in the form of vaccines. And the one that they've harnessed now is the H1N1 flu vaccine. So they can make 10 million doses of flu vaccine in 30 days. Is that a big deal? Well, it is because the current vaccine that we all get vaccinated with takes over six months to produce instead of 30 days. And guess what? It's made out of eggs. When I used to make vaccines, you had to inoculate every egg, tens of thousands of them, and then you harvest it. Well, that vaccine carries with it a little bit of proteins from the egg, which any of you that are allergic to eggs, you can't take the vaccine. So this doesn't have the allergy, plus it's a lot faster. So the Department of Defense and Homeland Security is really interested in this company and their technology. And the CDC has been testing their product and it should be on the market within a year and a half or two years. Another program we do for the farmers, again, the farmer's key, I keep coming back to the farmer, is we teach them how to work with all these crops and look for the future to when these specialty crops are coming down the pike so that if they're interested, they can stay abreast of that knowledge and learn how to uh, handle them and grow them. Because there's a lot of regulations about growing some of these crops that the FDA and the USDA impose. So what I'm saying, if you really sum it up, is we still have that huge potential for the future. We're looking at a bio-based economy. Folks, that's different from a petroleum-based economy. A bio-based economy means that you're using plants as factories to do all that stuff I've just talked about. It also means that you're going to end up with things like ed edible vaccines, drought-tolerant crops, new crops, new uses for existing crops, and probably a lot of things we haven't even thought about yet. So keep all of that in mind that it's the potential for the future. And think about the Biotechnology Crop Commercialization Center that I mentioned earlier. Great opportunity to take what we do well in North Carolina and make it even better. That's our goal. Now, I'm not going to tell you all about this, but one of our first projects that we've done in the Crop Center is work with that huge animal industry, and especially the swine industry. We're number two in swine production in the U.S., and uh, it's a huge crop, uh, probably about 30-some billion dollar crop in uh, North Carolina. And what we've done is we've learned how to create a new crop that we've never grown in North Carolina to feed these animals. So it saved the first year, it saved the industry about $30 million. Bottom line, all in all, as I told you why we were created, we're here to do all of this, to create jobs, to create new revenue for North Carolina citizens. Take those ideas that we help support through our research grants, to help take them to the companies that we help create, who then takes it to the marketplace. So then you've got a full package all the way from idea to market. So that's what we do. And as we do that, we're going to continue to be growing this intersection that I talked to you about at the very beginning, the intersection of agriculture and biotechnology. Now, before I end, I've got to tell you, I like to try to leave everybody laughing and so it's not quite so serious. But my astrophysicist wife told me a couple of jokes the other day. And she said, does, some of you folks may have studied physics. Does anybody in here know about the Higgs boson? You ever heard of the Higgs boson? You have? Well, you'll tell everybody else. So the, the story is that the Higgs boson uh, was, uh, how does this joke go? It was, uh, you, don't, you forgot to? The Higgs boson was wanting to go to a church. And it stopped in the church and it goes walking in. And the priest came up and said, I'm sorry, but we don't allow Higgs bosons to come to our church. And the Higgs boson says, what? He said, but without me, there's no mass. <laughs> well, if you're a physicist, you'll understand that.
Well, well the, other, the other joke she told me is about a photon. Probably everybody knows what a photon is, right? Photon, you know, light beams and all that. So what she told me is she said there was this photon that went up to a ticket counter in the airline and said, I need to buy a ticket to uh, Boston. And the person behind the counter says, okay, well, I'll get your ticket. Said, do you have any baggage to check? And the photon says, no, I'm traveling light. <laughs> so thank you very much. You've been a great audience and good to be here. Hi, I'm Russ Reed. I'm the executive director of, uh, of uh, the National Center for Biotechnology Workforce, uh, part of BioNetwork here at uh, Foresight Tech. And um, my colleague, are you going to take questions, right? Sure. Be great. great. My, my colleague, by the way, uh, Brooks uh, Foster, who actually is our communications manager for BioNetwork and does a lot of these uh, graphics and things that you've seen up front showing um, our next uh, um, uh, series coming along. Uh, so we thank Brooks for doing that. Uh, he's actually going to move around the audience and take your questions. So please, very, very important thing that we do here at, uh, at SciTech is to make sure that we get questions from the audience, that we make it interactive. And as you can see, Gwen's not shy about doing that, that sort of thing. So please, questions. Don't be shy. Andrea. Because of the hogs and uh, hogs and cattle and the the uh, excrements, that kind of thing, because that is, of course, in other words, take a problem and turn it into something good. Uh, Andrea, that's a great question. Uh, she asked, uh, "Do we work with the biofuels?" And we do on the fringe, but we haven't a lot for the last uh, three and a half, four years, because there was a biofuel center of North Carolina that we spun out about five years ago. And it, we'll probably be working with it a little bit more because the legislature dissolved that organization this year, this last budget uh, year. So they no longer exist. But they were, were doing exactly what you said. They were working with the hog growers to figure out how to use plants to get rid of the effluent and still have uh, viable plants that could grow a crop. Uh, right now, I think the contingent that's left that they didn't uh, dissolve is going to be under the NCDA, Department of Agriculture. But I'm sure we're going to be working with them real closely on that. And that's got to be one of their high priorities because it was when the Biofuel Center existed. Can you talk a little bit more about the Crop Commercialization Center, where that is, maybe some where it's housed? Um, and also the um, the agro biotech center a little bit more. If, is that out in the eastern part of the state? There or? is it's probably the agro biotech center. I'm not quite sure which one that is, unless it's part of the community college system. Yeah. Probably is. And uh, there's a office there. And uh, what they do is they try to promote uh, agriculture and biotech together. So it's part of the bio network and it's part of the community college system. And let's see, that was located. Okay, okay. you're talking about the one in Robinson. Okay. Ro Robinson County. Yeah, Lumberton, probably. Yeah, specifically yeah. Lumberton. That's a part of us, yes. Yeah. yeah. So uh, they, they try to do educational programs in that area to uh, work with the farmers and the Cooperative Extension Service and everybody. Our crop commercialization center that we started uh, about two years ago is run by Dr. Paul Ulanch, and it's just part of what we do, and it's actually housed in our offices. And so it's kind of virtual, but uh, what we do is we work with the industry to find out what <coughs> problems they've got at the marketplace and then work backwards, as I described. So our first project was really with the swine industry. They said, we need in North Carolina for swine and poultry 300 million bushels of grain a year to feed those animals. And primarily that's corn and soybeans. And they said the problem is for those 300 million, we have to bring in 200 million bushels a year from somewhere else. So the majority of it comes from the Midwest because that's the area where they grow most of the corn and soybeans. The problem with that is, they said, 
is for every one of those 200 million bushels we bring in, we have to pay a dollar and a half premium on freight. So that's $300 million that they had to pay and still have to pay that they could not pay if we were growing it here. The problem with growing it here is we don't have any more land. So what we did is we started a project with surrounding states to all work on the research and try to figure out well, how can we solve this. So the first answer we came up with was to do what they call double crop, which means you grow two crops on the same land, but you time them so that one is a winter crop and one is a summer crop. And that way you don't have to have any more land. And so the first year, they grew enough to save $30 million in freight. Now, that's not $300 million, but it's to start. So uh, that's the kind of thing that the Crop Center hopes to do with other crops that we grow well here in North Carolina. So again, if we were growing tomatoes, which we do, and there was some way that we could grow more of them and sell more of them, we go to the marketplace and say, what's the problem? Tell us what you think you could do, and then we'll try to find a solution. So what's the criteria for choosing a project? Something we, the, what she asked is what's the criteria for choosing a project? The criteria is a crop or something that we're trying to sell in North Carolina or a crop that we grow well in North Carolina and we want to export it. If we know we can do it well here, then we want to improve it. So that's the first criteria. Second criteria is if there's a problem that we can solve. Here's a question. Yes. Could you tell us, could you tell us what some of the problems or controversies, some of the problems or controversies that you face about potential problems with, with agricultural, by GMO specifically, and how do you address those? You know, that's an extremely important question because uh, genetically modified organisms is where there's a, 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 a lot of misinformation out in the public. It's almost, a, you've heard of urban legends about things. There's a lot of urban legends about what GMOs are and what they do. Um, it's very deep science, and it's science I don't understand because I'm not that kind of a scientist. But we know that we need to create new traits in these crops so that we can increase the yield or we can increase the nutrition. We know that's possible because the scientists that do it tell us it's possible. And most of these big companies, these six big companies I mentioned, they're all working on it. Next year, there should be three companies on the market with drought tolerant corn and probably drought tolerant soybeans. Corn comes first because it's our biggest crop. And it also is affected most by lack of water. What we know is our climate cycles have been doing this wild swings in the last couple of years. And it hasn't done that for about 80 years if you look backwards in, in climatology. So we don't know if that's a cycle that's gonna happen every 80 to 100 years or we don't know if it's true climate change it's causing that. It's probably both. But GMO type crops solving uh, water efficiency and solving some of these traits that haven't been figured out yet, uh, just because of the physiological makeup of disease, the scientists tell us that solving disease problems is going to be even more difficult than solving the water problem. So based on the complexity of how these things fit into the plants, there are varying degrees of complexity. So probably what you'll see the next couple of years is you'll see the first widespread use will be drought tolerance. The next one coming down the line will be uh, a fit more efficient use of nitrogen, which means fertilizer. That'll probably be next. And then closely following that will probably be disease resistance in the plants. So then somewhere muddled in all of that will probably be things like improved nutrition in a lot of the crops. And uh, so that you're getting much higher nutrition in some of the uh, soybeans, even more than it is now. 
and improved uh, omega oils in a lot of these crops that come off so that we know that it's things that are going to be benefiting health. So we're going to be seeing a lot more of that and that's probably the biggest challenge for the science but it's also the biggest challenge for talking about it to the public because you can't go around and talk about all these complicated science because nobody understands it. So uh, it's just very difficult to put all of this into layman's terms and so that's a huge challenge is learning how to do that. If uh, any of you are interested in this topic, uh, GMOs and the truth and the facts, because that's what we try to promote is the fact, science-based facts, there is a website, it's a very simple website to remember, it's called gmoanswers.com. And uh, so you can go there, you can ask questions, and you can see what the misinformation is as well as the truth. It's sponsored, the website is sponsored by the industry that's doing the research. And the people that answer the questions can be university scientists, or they can be government scientists, or they can be industry scientists. So they've tried to bring in a lot of science folks to answer it because they're the only ones that really understand the science. There's a question back there. Oh, you got one? Oh, Mr. Riddick, I wanted to thank you for coming for one yes. thing, but I'm curious to know, is there any way for local uh, gardeners or individuals to get on the bandwagon other than just talking it up? Um, you know, it's probably a good thing if um, people try to go to websites like the one I just mentioned and share that information with uh, your family and friends, and also go to some of the websites that are negative about GMOs and see how those people are trained and what their background is. Um, because sometimes, it's kind of like this lady asked, you have to know who's supporting what and how it's being paid for. Now, you, you got to expect that the industry is going to support it because they're trying to make a difference and they're trying to make money on it. But also, some of the people who are against GMOs also are trying to make money in another category. So you have to kind of look behind the curtain to see uh, how it's really represented. Another question? Yeah, this one over here. <clears throat> Thanks. Do you foresee the, the nine to ten billion dollar world uh, being forced to reduce the amount of meat they consume? Being forced to? Reduce the amount of meat that's consumed worldwide? I think it's too early to tell. Uh, what we do know about the developing countries that are raising their standard of wage so that you're starting to get, for example, in uh, China and uh, even in a lot of the Asian areas outside of China, you're starting to get a middle class. And what we've seen them demand first as they get more money in their wages and everything is meat. Now, China is working very hard to try to increase their meat production. They don't have any of the technology that we have. So what you see them doing is they're coming in and buying it. Uh, they just bought one of the largest producers in the United States uh, six months ago, which is uh, uh, Murphy Farms and Smithfield, which is headquartered in Virginia. And uh, one of the big companies out of China just bought it, mainly because the, I'm told that the Chinese really recognize brands and brands are very important to the middle class when they go to buy food and so one of the things they identify with is a branded name because they know that if it's branded in America it's probably very high quality and so they want to they want to get it to be a part of that now we're already shipping them a lot of it so it's we may ship them more but they're one of the biggest customers for uh, pork in the, in the world question back here Yes. Did you mean also, I guess, fish farming? Right. But did you also mean the, the farming that would extract the algae and those types of plants that you discover have properties? Does that happen on the North Carolina coast? Or it does. It, it really does, huh? It really does. We've got a huge uh, marine uh, research uh, contingent. <laughs> There's about uh, three or four universities, and the community college has a couple colleges on the coast that are working in marine bioscience. 
and they're teaching it. And they're also doing a lot of research at the universities in marine uh, growth in the ocean where you're growing, in other words, you put them in a corral in the ocean and uh, also on land, which is called aquaculture. So you've got uh, biomarine aquaculture and then you've got land aquaculture. So they're doing that for the fishes and they're studying uh, all of the different diseases of oysters and all these other things that we're told are kind of dying down because they're either being over fished or over harvested and also because they're starting to see new diseases that they didn't know existed before. So all of those things are coming to play and they're also looking at things like kelp and algae not only for food but one of the big sources of omegas omega oils for health. Another one is krill. You probably already know that one that's in your pharmacy on the shelf. It's called krill oil. It's real high in omega-3s. Whole new world. One last question. Right down here. Have you given any attention to the problem of no more land in the direction of reclaiming some of the land that we have destroyed by building larger cities on fertile land and then abandoning that and going out and pushing down more forests to expand whenever we have development? Or another simple thing that has just started is putting farms for <clears throat> producing energy on farmland instead of building and on top of buildings which would save the good farmland to grow food and crops for all these other good purposes. We don't need farms for collecting sun energy. <laughs> you, you, you probably read that North Carolina is number two in solar production. I've read that same thing. We don't really get involved in that. Right. Right. Well, you know, what you're talking about is a socio-economic socio problem. And it's also talking about you're starting to bring in topics of free enterprise and capitalism. And whether or not you tell a landowner you cannot use this land for this use. So we're starting to talk about freedom of land use and freedom of ownership of land. So you start getting into a lot of uh, highly ethical, debatable things. You're getting your master's degree in ethics. So you're starting to talk about a lot of these social issues that uh, impinge upon our future and our science. And my answer is it all needs to be debated. And people need to listen to it on both sides with an open mind because there's some good issues on both sides. Number one is, it's kind of sad to use really good farmland for something that's not going to be farming. But we've been doing that for thousands of years. It's not a good thing. But at the same time, you've got to debate how are you going to let people have freedom of use of their own land that they work for and they paid good money for. You're going to have somebody come in and dictate. And I'm not going to argue that point. But I'm just saying there's two sides of every argument. There are, but the problem is there seems to be no mindset that we can promote as an attractive to put in these small land that's already been destroyed. Yeah. Well, I think there is a mindset to do that both directions. But I think sometimes you hear one side more than you hear the other. And I think that's important to get a really good debate going so that you've got really knowledgeable people talking about it. Great. Thank you. Thanks um, for that. Gwen, on behalf of the college and on behalf of BioNetwork uh, and our center, I want to thank you very much for being here today. I want to thank to Susan here. for lending us you <laughs> freshly into retirement. <laughs> and um, I, w I want to thank all the staff that is involved with putting on SciTech. It's a, it's a big function. There's a lot, of, a lot of people involved. If they are and they are involved, please stand up so we take a bow today. Thanks. <laughs> Gwen, you ran away too quickly. Oh. To do here. Now we know you have your MBA. So right. 
on behalf of uh, the college and uh, signed by Dr. Green, here's a special certificate for your presence today. Thank you very much. Outstanding. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And don't go away. Don't go away. And we have a lovely folder for you to oh, take notes as into your new consultants. That don't have to carry that ugly green thing, right? We've got a bag. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Outstanding. Thank you very much. Thanks. So I, I want to, again, thank everybody that's involved with SciTech, and thank you for coming from, from the community. There's a lot of people here that are very interested in this subject, and I think uh, Gwen handles it so well. Uh, it's, it's a very controversial one, but it's a very needed one for the future. So um, with that, I think we'll adjourn, and I just want to let you know that um, we do have, an, as you saw, um, Brooks uh, Foster put up a really nice slide at the beginning that shows that we do have two really interesting speakers coming up in both February and March. Around the third week, it's always the Thursday, it's always at 4 o'clock, and we have Stephen Hill, Dr. Stephen Hill, coming in from Targacept. Uh, this is a fledgling company out of um, Winston-Salem that is looking for a good positive clinical hit, and uh, maybe by the time they, that Stephen Hill comes in here, he might have something to shed with us. I'm not sure about that. And then we have Paul Kutnar coming in from SciWorks in March. So please join us for those events, and you'll see a lot of uh, pub publicity within, um, uh, within the college and around the community. Thank you very much. Have a good evening.